I normally don't get nervous when I do presentations. Um, not as nervous as you might think. But today, I, I was really nervous in preparing for this. And I think it had partly to do with the fact that this project, my involvement in the project, um, had to do with two areas that I, I really felt like I was a novice in, and kind of dealing with poetry, and also working with the digital aspects of encoding and computer markup. And um, Doug Knox over at the one point two from HDW really helped me a lot at the kind of learning how to do the computer stuff that is part of this project. But I think coming to this project as a complete novice in both areas of poetry and in digital markup, um, I felt that in a way that the choices that I struggled to make throughout the project reflected how, um, in a way, a process that can seem purely mechanical is at times also a literary experience. And I think, Annalisa, when you were scanning those hundreds and hundreds of images, I can kind of feel the monotony of that process, but at the same time, it was kind of an experiencing of Merrill's work, where she was getting, I think, a lot of the ideas for the idea of revision over a span of time. And I think for me, my, my biggest takeaway from this process was um, kind of my struggle um, to fit things into boxes and how things would not fit into neat little boxes, especially in Merrill's work, because of the range of material that we have in our archives, but also because of the nature of Merrill's poetry. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. Um, but first, I wanted to explain a little bit about the digital markup process, and there's something wrong with my PowerPoint. It's not supposed to look like that. Um, but the digital markup process is part of kind of a, a way of looking at text and information in the humanities that started, I want to say, at least two decades ago with the launching of the Text Encoding Initiative in 1994, commonly known as TEI. And TEI still to this day continues to release guidelines that are meant to help scholars in the humanities process their text and data um, in a way that a computer can read and then kind of be told what to do with. Um, and I wanted to show you a quick example of how that works. Shannon already showed you one version of, of our XML markup process. And um, in the actual example that I saw on my screen, you got a lot more information about what the um, markup process looked like. The, if I say tags, I tag stuff. Does that mean anything to everyone? Is that a familiar term? Where, you know, I. We use different tags to serve as basically fences or containers for the information inside those tags, right? So if we have a line group tag, as we see at the beginning up there, um, everything between the opening and closing tag of the line group tag is indicated as a line group. And same with lines, um, same with notes, um, different revisions, all come with different labels. Um, and one struggle that we had was deciding what labels to use. One of the great things about the TEI guidelines um, is that it provides you with so many different choices for the tags that you could use because it is aware of the range of information that we deal with as humanities scholars. And it also allows for a flexibility in which the project um, developers can also come up with their own tags as necessary, depending on the nature of the project that they are working with. But you can't imagine with this kind of range of flexibility that the number of choices that we have to make on our end it was a little overwhelming. Um, and it started with something as simple as deciding what kind of revision was happening in a given moment in the manuscript. Um, we have a range of tags available to code revisions. And so if we see something that is written above a given word in a different writing implement, do we treat that as an addition to the text and mark it in the add tag? Um, or is it providing an alternative and not necessarily replacing what was there originally? Is it just a note that Merrill wrote there? Um, and I think that we tried to come up with a kind of a consistent set of guidelines that came from an understanding of how the revision happened over a process of time. But there's always a concern that you have as somebody who's working on a project like this that you are limiting the potential of the original information. If we tag something as an addition, are we forever marking that as an addition to the readers who experience the information through our markup? Um, so 
even something as potentially simple as whether something is an addition or not, we had to kind of struggle with in terms of how to mark up. And when it came to the content markup, it got, it got even more um, difficult. And um, for instance, TEI provides different ways to mark up um, people's names. So if there is a person's name in the text, you put a tag around it that indicates it's a person's name. But then, how do you categorize the people? Who, who counts as a person in, in the Book of Ephraim, right? When you have a text where um, an arguably, you know, like, like spiritual figures, I, I want to say, I was going to say fictional and then I got scared. I don't know, I was going to say fictional figures. Um, these spiritual figures exist on the same plane as, for instance, people like W.H. Auden, who, who lived for reals that we know, and then died, and is speaking to Merrill on the same level as, as a spiritual figure like Abram. And then you have other people who are around Merrill. You have um, people who Merrill doesn't know specifically, but mentions, like Freud or Wagner. Um, and then you have fictional people that Merrill refers to. Do all these count as person names? Um, and if they do, do we want to categorize them and separate them out in some way and distinguish between Ephraim and Wagner, or are they the same? Is that our decision to make as the curators of the digital archive? Um, these are the issues that we constantly struggle with in working with um, a poem of the nature of the book of Ephraim. So I wanted to give you um, one example of, of the different ways in which the digital markup process can affect reading. Um, I think this is the same image that you pulled up, Janet, earlier. I think we both picked this for a reason. This is one of the ones that we struggled with the most um, because of the complexity of the layout of the text, but also the picture. I, I don't know how many <laughs> weeks we spent trying to figure out what do we do with the picture. Um, and it might seem like a trivial thing, you know, it's, it's a picture just you know, represented in some way, but. Um, for instance, if you look at the Samuel Beckett archive, they provide a search feature that allows you to just pull up all the doodles in Beckett's manuscripts. And it just kind of gives you a, a thumbnail list of all the doodles. You can click on them and see them in the original context. And looking at other archives that did things like that, I started wondering, what is the value of pulling out all the doodles in a given text? But then also, even before that, what actually counts as a doodle, right? Um, I, I, my friend just last week told me the story, she, she studies modernism, and this might be a famous story, I had never heard it before, about um, James Joyce's manuscripts and how apparently scholars had poured over these pencil dots in the margins like, forever, and then somebody hypothesized that it might just be where Joyce was resting his pencil while he was <laughs> reading over his own work. And so I think as, as people who come after an author and are trying to figure out what to do with the wealth of material in his manuscripts. Um, it really is a project of, you know, what do we see here? What do we make of this? And, and I think the digital process adds another layer to that. How are we going to categorize this when we're tagging? And how are we going to represent this to our users? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So like I said, this was one of the most challenging ones, but we did succeed over many days in creating a digital markup XML file for this particular image. But then the question was, what do we do with it? How do we represent it to the users? Because if we had given to you um, something that looked kind of like that, some of us would be very happy. Other of us, others of us, I think, would not be very happy with all those ankle brackets that kind of look like they're getting in the way of the reading experience, right? So our next task was to decide how are we going to represent the um, not only the information that is on the page, but the, the additional information in a way that we've created through the markup process. Um, we've gone back and forth, and we still haven't completely decided on what the best way to do this is. I'm sure we'll never be able to fully decide. But the current version that you see on our web archive is a kind of our best attempt at faithfully representing um, in a text transcription format what was originally on the image. You can see how you know, we try to replicate the colors, so the stuff that's in pencil is in gray over here, and there's the pink. Um, we have the doodle kind of, I don't know if you can see it right here. Oh god, this mouse. Um, we couldn't textually represent the image other than through an editorial note where we said there was an image here, it was a space. Um, so we 
have this interpretation of our markup, this kind of full faithful replication. But then we also have, not on the web archive, I don't think right now, a version that is from the exact same image and from the exact same SNL file, but processed completely differently, where all of the side notes are stripped out, all of the deletions that Merrill made by striking through a word are actually taken out, and this is what we call the top layer copy, a kind of art version of what we think the text would have looked like if all of Merrill's revisions had actually been implemented. And we've been using this to kind of try to come up with a way to just compare the different drafts of the poem and track the revision process. But you can see in the difference between the extreme examples of this stripped down, text only, top layer version, and this extremely layered, very complex, and sometimes hard to read version that but the range of choices we had in how to present our XML marker was extraordinary. And of course, we have the examples of the other archives that we saw. Um, there was, for instance, I forget the name now, a Virginia Woolf um, online edition that lets you toggle certain things on and off, like you can toggle certain revisions on and off. And then I started thinking, well, OK, we have this really complicated version, but what if we could have a view that users could say, show me only the editions? Show me only the parts where Merrill um, crossed out a word. Show me only the parts where Merrill wrote something in pink. Does that matter? I don't know. But you can imagine how that leads to so many different possibilities in how we read one given image. So that's one thing that we um, are still struggling with and trying to figure out how best to present kind of the structural information that is on an image in various web displays. Um, and then the next part that we're working with is um, Kind of, I alluded this to a little bit earlier when we are doing the content markup of a given image and given text. What tags are we going to use and how are we going to categorize things? Um, so I talked a little bit about the person name issue, but that's just kind of one small tip of the iceberg. Um, Merrill mentions a lot of places in his poem, and so we started tagging the place names. And then I had this moment this past summer, um, is heaven a place? Somebody asked me, one of the undergraduate students working on the project, like, do I tag heaven as a place? And I happened upon this moment where I had to decide whether heaven was a place or not. And, and so I said, oh, well, let's, let's say it's a place because it is pointed to as kind of a, a space in the poem. But let's try to distinguish between Venice and heaven. I mean, they're similar in many ways, maybe, but um, completely different in others. And so we started trying to try to come up with a way to label these places. And again, like with calling me from a fictional person, I started saying heaven was a fictional place. And then like, no, I can't, I can't say that. Um, I, so we landed with geographical and non-geographical. That works for now. But as we continue working through the sections of the poem, I am sure we will come across a place name that is somehow neither geographical or non-geographical. And then at that point, we'll have to come up with a new way to categorize. Um, so in a way, this project is, is kind of a futile one, trying to make boxes for a, a body of work that refuses to be put into boxes. But at the same time, I think in our efforts to make these boxes, it, it's, it's a, definitely an act of reading and interpretation. And it's inviting the readers to also read and interpret the wealth of material that we have in our archives um, in new and exciting ways. So I hope you follow along with us, like Shannon said, we have the entirety of Section A up right now for you to look at, and we are going to make sure that the remaining sections get up in a slow but surely in steady form. So please follow us in our new adventure of reading Merrill digitally. Thank you.